What, what is the root issue for that hatred towards our black brothers and sisters? The Lord woke me up kind of in the middle of the night and he answered that question. And, and the answer was, because they're my chosen people. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to Jerusalem with great slaughter. Many outrages and atrocities were committed against the remainder of the people. It has been estimated that over one million Hebrews fled into the interiors of Africa from Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Hebrew slaves. To reconnect to your history, you need to do three things. One, you need to redefine who the children of Judah are according to the old references. Not from the 1900s to newer, because those books tend to have a totally, completely different history in those books. So you have to ask yourself, how did we lose this in history? How did you lose 400,000 people in history? And the reason why I say how did you lose 400,000 people in history is not in the books. Many people in today's time, many Israelites who don't know their heritage or who they are, are looking back. Now it is up to us to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Damien Gibbs, Raleigh, North Carolina. Phyllis Redmond, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Dwayne. All right, Sam. Shalom. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, all right. We're going to allow a little bit more time for people to come on through, and I actually have to put out uh, one more um, push to an assembly, so give me one second. Okay. And for those that were on the call uh, yesterday, uh, last night, I've actually gone ahead and um, cleaned the audio up a little bit, and I'm actually... Um, exporting it right now to a video and I'll push that out probably sometime tonight um, so just so you guys are aware all right I'm good to go all right let's go ahead and uh, open up in prayer I'll be out thank you for this time that we have again to come together in your name and for your purpose I pray for peace, shalom, clarity of mind, ears to hear, a heart to receive in regards to the message and the history of your people. I pray that those that hear this conversation and hear these words will allow themselves to hear your voice and what you called them to do in their life this day. For we are your children, we hear your voice, and we seek to do your will. I now come against and speak against any distractions that may try to come against us during this conversation and during this discourse. Um, I pray, again, that the hearers be edified with the wisdom that is found in the scriptures and of our history, that as we learn this history, we will not repeat the mistakes of the past. I speak a blessing over each one that does hear this message, hear this reading, and hear this conversation. And I pray this prayer in the name of your son, the name above every name, 
Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, um, like yesterday, real quick, and I know some folks are, are still coming on, um, but we're going to get, get moving with it. So those that are on, if you can, just do a, a quick roll call. Just simply state um, your name and what city you're from. Yvonne Phoenix. Kim, North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina. Damien, Raleigh, North Carolina. Karen, Raleigh, North Carolina. Charmin, San Antonio. Philip, Austin, Texas. Phyllis, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. All right, all right. Blessings and blessings and blessings. I appreciate you all being here. Um, there will be more people that, you know, pop on through. Um, that's fine. Try not to get too distracted by uh, the timing of them coming in or in case their call drops, they have to go. They might exit out. Don't be distracted by that. Um, but um, to recap what we went over yesterday, we went over Matthew chapter 2 to set the foundation of the lesson. And then we went into Josephus book 12, of Antiquities of the Hebrews, chapter 1, chapter 5. And then after that, we went into 1 Maccabees, chapter 1 and 2. And uh, we did very well. I'm actually pretty proud of, of us. Uh, we, we got through a lot. We actually kind of uh, powered through most of that in about an hour and some change. Um, the rest of that time was pretty much a lot of dialogue and discussion. This is a time for open dialogue and discussion, so don't be shy um, because then you're making things harder for me to edit out the dead and white space. So, um, you know, be interactive. Um, there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. We're all growing and learning. And your opinion and view on the subject matter does count. It does matter. So don't, don't shy back from your um, whatever the most high is. Um, revealing to you and whatever you're coming to understanding of, please go ahead and bring that out because it's to the edification of this, uh, those of us on this call as well as those that will hear it maybe on a future hearing, okay, because these recordings, uh, these are recorded and um, they'll be pushed out to each assembly to kind of recap and take notes, all right? That being said, right. absolutely, you will want to take notes, um, we're not just hanging out um, for an hour or so. Um, take notes and, um, in fact, what I'm going to end up doing um, now, I'm actually going to um, do a recap in regards to, I asked some questions specifically out of Matthew Chapter 2, and I'm just curious for those that are actually on the call right now, um, how many of you took the initiative to actually find the information I had posed in regards to the two questions? There's two questions in Matthew chapter 2 in regards to the two prophets. I wanted to get an idea of my question for you is, if you take the initiative to find out who those prophets were and where can I find those passages, passages of Scripture in the Old Testament? I'll be honest, I haven't looked yet. This is Myra. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom, up, um, Dwayne, and I'm going to be honest as well. I don't know if I even heard those questions if I was on the phone at the time when you had posed them. I'm just not sure. Yeah, if you came in later, then you didn't hear it because the very first book we went into was the book of Matthew chapter 2. And um, the reason for that was that um, let's see here. the reason for that was um, as Christians, those of us that came to the Christian background, right? The issue was that we've been taught a lie that between Malachi to Matthew, there was 400 plus years of silence. And that was 
essentially the justification as to why there were no more books within the Christian canon was to say and lie to the world and say there's the Most High was so upset with Israel that after Malachi he just turned his back walked away and said kick rocks um, and there's no history and just all of a sudden out of nowhere we pop up Matthew and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and Yeshua and that's where most Christians want to plop you into they say well the Old Testament is the Old Testament it's old gone and done away with and thus we're going to start you off with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and that's the the foundation of the Christian story is from there um, and they they disregard um, the Old Testament and they completely just overlook and lie and say that there was no history between that time period and the reality there was and that's what we've been reading the past day okay um, we've been reading actually information found before Maccabees and also augmented information um, that is coming from a different perspective in regards to the Maccabean period. Um, another note, a lot of modern Hebrew Israelites um, are repeating the sins. Actually, I've, they're repeating the sins of the past of the Pharisees. Okay? Um, now, what I'm thinking about is I'm saying that the reality is that most of the Pharisees were not even Israelites during the time of Yeshua. Most of the Pharisees were a mix they were a mixture of Edomite Yahudim. Alright. So um what you have is you have the Edomite Yahudim that somehow you we don't know about this, we don't learn about this. They took over and dominated our people in our land. So here we are, the southern kingdom, you got, you know, Judah, Levi, and Benjamin, and you don't recognize this unless you dig deeper to find out the history, that Yeshua was born in a time frame very much like today. Now, in America, we may not understand what I mean by that when you look at the script, but for our brothers and sisters on the continent, they know very well what I'm talking about. Because our brothers and sisters that are on the continent of Africa, specifically West Africa, and some of the other uh, predominantly Bantu people, nations and states, um, or countries, I should say, they're ruled by Edomite, Yahudim, or Ishmaelites. Today. And that's the situation that Yeshua himself was raised up in. He was literally raised up where Edomites were, the descendants of Esau, were ruling over Israel. They were ruling over the Israelites living in Judea. And what we're not taught is we're not taught how in the world that happened. So we have to bring that history out. So the, the purpose of these calls is essentially to go ahead and highlight some of this history that has been overlooked. Real talk, many of you um, have purchased Apocryphas. You got your 1611 with the Apocrypha. You got other resources, and the reality is most of you, not all, have not cracked it open. Or most of you have gone in limited depth into uh, the additional works. And so this is to kind of together go over this content and it's really important for those of us that just really haven't been exposed to this material all right so um going back to matthew chapter two real real quick all right so uh you have you know verse one you have um a situation where it talks about yeshua being born in, in bethlehem judea in the days of Herod the king, and I asked a question that we'll eventually get to, and that is, who is Herod? Where does he come from? And who appointed him to be king? Because in the New Testament, it's not declared any history about him or his family. Okay? Um, after that, 
it goes into some prophecies because you have the Magi that come from the East. I post a question, which might take time to get through, and I was simply, potentially, who might these Magi from the East of Jerusalem be? But they, uh, King Herod had demanded a question of them, and that was in regards to um, essentially where the Mashiach would be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So my question yesterday was, um, who is this prophet? And where can I find this information? Which in verse 6 it says, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor or ruler that shall rule, by, that shall rule my people Israel. So my question today was, did anybody find that information? Know the name of the prophet that said that and where we can actually find that in the script. So um, I will actually go there right now. And... That is actually going to be in Micah. And before I do that one, there's another one as well. So I'm going to give you the two, the two prophets real quick. You have Shua or Hosea, and you have Micah. So that's where you find that. Uh, verse 15, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of Yah by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. All right? That's in um, Hosea 11 and 1. So um, we'll deal with that later. Essentially, what I wanted to do was I want you guys to actually think to find this stuff out. When I was a kid, I used to love doing this. I'm looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I'm like, man, okay, some prophet said this. Where can I find that in the Old Testament? Um, oftentimes, it, I can find it, but it was worded differently because it wasn't based off the Septuagint, uh, which I will do another um, conference call where we will get into the Septuagint because that is very important. Any of you that are looking to study doctrine, meaning you're looking for something to stand upon, um, those of you that like debating, which I do not debate, but if those of you that want to debate and you want to like, you know, really know that you know that you know, if you're not in the Septuagint, you've lost already. It's just plain and simple as that. Um, but today what we're going to get into, we're going to jump right into um, Josephus, Antiquities of the Hebrews, chapter 7. And then we're going to go ahead and get into 1 Maccabees chapter 3 and then going into chapter 4. Uh, I believe time-wise we should be able to make it. And we will get into the dedication of the temple, the rededication of the temple. All right. Now, each chapter I read, I will stop and pause, and then we will have a discussion or a midrash where the floor will be open for you to go ahead and discuss um, what your thoughts were on that chapter. All right. Now, um, in regards to chapter 1 and chapter 2 of uh, First Maccabees, and in regards to chapter 5 of Antiquities of the Hebrews, um, it closed out at the death of Matthew, or Matthew. Okay? He's the father of the Hasmonean family. Um, Hasmonean being that the grandfather was named Shimon or Simon or Simeon, however you want to pronounce it. All right, and so that's why they're known as the Hasmonean dynasty. So that 400 year time period was really dominated by the Hasmonean dynasty. Uh, spoiler alert, not too spoiler alert, but there were some issues that happened towards the end of the Hasmonean dynasty that led 
to the rising of the Herodian dynasty and the rising of what is now known as Edomite Jews or Edomite Yahudim. So um, let's get right into it. Please go ahead and mute your phones if you know how to. And uh, when I'm done with this chapter, unmute yourselves so that you can be a part of the discussion. And take to the Hebrews chapter 7. When Apollonius, the general of the Samaritan forces, heard this, he took his army and made haste to go against Judas, who met him and joined battle with him and beat him and slew many of his men. And among them, Apollonius himself, their general, whose sword being that which he happened in the wear, he seized upon and kept for himself. But he wounded more than he slew and took a great deal of prey from the enemy's camp and went his way. But when Seron, who was general of the army of Polisiria, heard that many had joined themselves to Yuda and that he had about him an army sufficient for fighting and for making war, he determined to make an expedition against him as thinking it became him to endeavor to punish those that transgressed the king's injunctions. Um, I feel led, I'm going to have to kind of give a precursor to what took place. Previously, in First and Second Maccabees, you have it where uh, in Jerusalem, our people were, were literally lied to and deceived. And on the Sabbath day, where... Um, Ptolemy's forces were able to literally walk right on through, kill, torture, maim everybody, rape, pillage, strip the temple bare, um, just violated uh, Jerusalem. And then not only Jerusalem, but the surrounding areas as well, okay? Um, you also have Ptolemy making it a, a law that every nation in that region would conform to the Greek way of doing things, that they would do away with all their laws, statutes, commandments, customs, and follow the ways of the Gentiles. You had some of our people that actually went ahead with that, and then you have a situation where the righteous ones were slaughtered, they were tortured, they were crucified, their infants were, were destroyed, um, they were literally from month to month as they hid away in hidden places, they were hunted down like animals until you have the Hasmonean family, which is a Levitical family, um, a father and his sons that rose up to then say enough is enough. We're not going to stand for this. We're going to stand for righteousness and we're going to actually fight back against this King Ptolemy and we're going to stand for righteousness and cleanse the land of this wickedness. And so we are now at that point where, led by Judah Maccabee, or Judah Mac, he is out there, the general of Israel's armies, standing up for righteousness for our people in the face of a mighty Gentile power. All right? So moving forward, he then got together an army as large as he was able and joined it to the Runigate and wicked Jews, Yahudi, and came against Judah. So you actually have here wicked Yahudi coming against the righteous Judah Maccabee and his family. He then came as far as Bethron, a village of Judea, and there pinched his camp upon which Judah met him. And when he intended to give him battle, he saw that his soldiers were backward to fight because their number was small and because they wanted food, for they were fasting. He encouraged them and said to them, that victory and conquest of enemies are not derived from the multitude and armies, but in the exercise of piety towards Elohim, and that they have the plainest instances in their forefathers, who by their righteousness and exerting themselves on behalf of their own laws and of their own children, had frequently conquered many tens of thousands, for innocence is the strongest army. By this speech, he induced his men to contend the multitude of the enemy 
and to fall upon Sedon. And upon joining battle with him, he beat the Syrians. And when their general fell amongst the rest, they all ran away with speed as thinking that to be their best way of escaping. So he pursued them unto the plain and slew about 800 of the enemy, but the rest escaped to the region which lay near to the sea. Now when King Antiochus heard of these things, he was very angry at what had happened. So he got together all his own army with many mercenaries whom he had hired from the islands. My question for you Research, ask the question to yourself, who could these mercenaries have been during this time frame from the quote-unquote islands? And took with them and prepared to break into Judea about the beginning of the spring. But when, upon his mustering his soldiers, he perceived that his treasures were deficient and there was a want of money in them, for all the taxes were not paid, by reason of the seditions there had been among the nations, he having been so magnanimous and so liberal that what he was not sufficient for him, he therefore resolved first to go into Persia and collect the taxes of that country. Hereupon he left one whose name was Lysias, who was in a great repute with him, governor of the kingdom, as far as the bounds of Egypt and the lower Asia and reaching from the river Euphrates and committed to him a certain part of his forces and of his elephants, and charged him to bring up his son Antiochus with all possible care until he came back, and that he should conquer Judea and take its inhabitants for slaves and utterly destroy Jerusalem and abolish the whole nation. And when King Antiochus had given these things in charge to Lysias, he went into Persia, and in the 147th year, he passed over Euphrates and went to the superior provinces. Now upon this, Lysias chose Ptolemy, the son of Dorimenes, and Nicanor, and Gorgias, very potent men among the king's friends, and delivered to them 40,000 foot soldiers, 7,000 horsemen, and sent them against Judea, who came as far as the city Emmaus, and pitched their cap in the plain country. There came also them auxiliaries out of Syria and the country round about as many of the Runigate Jews or Yahudi. And besides, these came from merchants to buy those that should be carried captives. <sighs> All right. Having bonds with them to bind those that should be made prisoners. With that silver and gold which they were to pay for their price. And when Judah saw their camp and how numerous their enemies were, he persuaded his own soldiers to be of good courage and exhorted them to place their hopes in victory in God and to make supplication to him according to the custom of their country, clothed in sackcloth and to show what was their usual habit of supplication in the greatest dangers and thereby to prevail with Elohim to grant them the victory over their enemies. So he set them in their ancient order of battle used by their forefathers under their captains of thousands and other officers and dismissed such as were newly married as well as those that had newly gained possessions that they might not fight in a cowardly manner out of an inordinate love of life in order to enjoy those blessings. Now, when he had thus disposed his soldiers, he encouraged them to fight by the following speech, which he made to them. O oh, my fellow soldiers, no other time remains more opportune than the present for courage and contempt of dangers. For if you now fight manfully, you may recover your freedom which as it is a thing of itself agreeable to all men. So it proves to be as much more desirable by its affording the liberty of worshiping Elohim. Since, therefore, you are in such circumstances at present, you must either recover that freedom and so regain a happy and blessed way of living, 
which is that according to our laws and customs of our country, or to submit to the most opprobrious sufferings, nor will any seed of your nation remain if you beat in this battle. Fight, therefore, manfully, and suppose that you must die, though you do not fight, but believe that besides such glorious rewards as those of freedom of your country, your laws, and your religion, you shall then obtain everlasting glory. Prepare yourselves, therefore, and put yourselves into such an agreeable posture that you may be ready to fight with the enemy as soon as it is day tomorrow morning. And this was the speech which Judah made to encourage them. But when the enemy sent Gorgias with 5,000 foot and 1,000 horse, that he might fall upon Judah by night and have for that purpose certain of the Runigate Yehudi as guides, mm. the son of Matayahu perceived it and resolved to fall upon those enemies that were in their camp. Now their forces were divided. When they had therefore supped in good time and had left many fires in their camp, he marched all night to those enemies that were in Amias, so that when Gorgias found no enemy in their camp, but suspected that they were tired and hidden themselves among the mountains, he resolved to go and seek them wherever they were. But about break of day, Judah appeared to those enemies that were in Amias with only 3,000 men and those ill-armed by reason of their poverty. And when he saw the enemy very well and skillfully fortified in their camp, he turned, encouraged the Yahudi, and told them that they ought to fight, though it were with their naked bodies, for that Elohim had sometimes of old given such men strength and that against such as were more in number and were also armed out of great regard to their great courage. So he commanded the trumpeters to sound for the battle and by thus falling upon the enemy when they did not expect it and thereby astonishing and disturbing their minds. He slew many of those that resisted him and went on pursuing the rest as far as Gadara and in the plains of Idumia, Astod, Yamnia, and of these there fell about 3,000. Yet did Judah exhort his soldiers not to be too desirous of the spoils, for that they still must have a contest in battle with Gorgias and the forces that were with him, but that when they had once overcome them, then they might securely plunder the camp because they were the only enemies remaining and they expected no others. And just as he was speaking to his soldiers, Gorgias' men looked down into the army which they left in the camp and saw that it was overthrown. The camp burnt, for the smoke that arose from it showed them, even when they were a great way off, what had happened. When, therefore, those that were with Gorgias understood the things that were in this posture and perceived that those that were with Judah were ready to fight them, they also were frightened and put to flight. But Judah, as though he had already beaten Gorgias' soldiers without fighting, returned and seized on the spoils. He took a great quantity of gold, silver, purple, blue, and then returned home with joy, singing hymns to Elohim for their good success. For this victory greatly contributed to the recovery of their freedom. Hereupon, Lysias was confounded at the defeat of the army which he had sent. And the next year he got together 60,000 chosen men. He also took 5,000 horsemen and fell upon Judea, and he went up to the hill country of Bethsur, a village of Judea, and pitched his camp there, 
where Judah met him with 10,000 men. And when he saw the great number of his enemies, he prayed to Elohim that he would assist him and join battle with the first of the enemy that appeared and beat them, slew them, about 5,000, and thereby became terrible to the rest of them. Nay, indeed, Lysias, observing the great spirit of the Yahudi, how they were prepared to die rather than lose their freedom, and being afraid of their desperate way of fighting, as if it were real strength, he took the rest of the army back with him and returned to Antioch, where he enlisted foreigners into the service and prepared to fall upon Judea with an even greater army. When, therefore, the generals of Antiochus' armies had been beaten so often, Judah assembled the people together and told them that after these many victories, which Elohim had given them, they ought to go to Jerusalem and purify the temple and offer the appointed sacrifices. But as soon as he, with the whole multitude, was come to Jerusalem and found the temple deserted and its gates burnt down, and plants growing in the temple of their own accord on account of its desertion. He and those that were with him began to lament and were quite confounded at the sight of the temple. So he chose out of some of his soldiers and gave them order to fight against those guards that were in the citadel until he should have purified the temple. When therefore he had carefully purged it and had brought in new vessels, the candlestick, the table of the showbread, the altar of incense, which were made of gold. He hung up the veils at the gates, added doors to them. He also took down the altar of burnt offering and built a new one of stones that he had gathered together, and not of such as were hewn with iron tools. So on the five and twentieth day of the month of Kaslu, which the Macedonians call Apelles, they lighted the lamps that were on the candlestick and offered incense upon the altar and laid the loaves upon the table of showbread. And offered burnt offerings upon the altar, the new off altar of burnt offering. Now so fell out that these things were done on the very same day on which their divine worship had fallen off and was reduced to profane and common use after three years' time. For so it was that the temple was made desolate by Antiochus and so continued for three years. This desolation happened to the temple in the 145th year on the 25th day of the month of Apelius. And on the 153rd Olympiad, but it was dedicated anew on the same day, the 25th of the month of Peleus, and the 148th year, and on the 154th Olympiad. And this desolation came to pass according to the prophecy of Daniel, which was given 408 years before. For he declared that the Macedonians would dissolve that worship for some time. Um, last night, I had asked you guys also to ask the question during this time period, who were the Macedonians? Now, you just celebrated the festival of the restoration of the sacrifices of the temple for eight days and omitted no sort of pleasure thereupon, but he feasted them upon very rich and pl splendid sacrifices, and he honored Elohim and delighted them by hymns and psalms. Nay, they were so very glad at the revival of their customs when after a long time of intermission they unexpectedly had regained the freedom of their worship, that they made it law for their posterity 
that they should keep a festival on account of the restoration of their temple worship for eight days. And from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and call it lights. I suppose the reason was because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us and that thence was the name given to that festival, Yuda, also rebuilt the walls round about the city, reared towers of great height against the incursion of enemies, and set guards therein. He also fortified the city, Batsura, that it might serve as a citadel against any distresses that might come from our enemies. And that was Josephus, Antiquities of the Hebrews, Chapter 7. Go ahead and go ahead and unmute yourself, and let's discuss this. What are your thoughts? Um, it's a lot of good meat in there. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself, and please go ahead and chime in. Um, this is Myra. Um, the the main thing that captured my thought, well, two two things is that, as usual, we have those of us um, in Israel that are traitors you know, um, that side with the enemy. But the main thing is that with um, the Maccabees, they they were in righteousness with Yah. And even though, again, we weren't, our numbers were small, they were still victorious over the enemies because Yah was with us. And when we have him with us, we will always be victorious. Amen. Absolutely. Great insight on that. Yeah. Anybody Thank else? You. Go ahead. I I was struck by the uh, <clears throat> by the language because it was it just it sounded like uh, you know if you had just been reading that out of you know if I didn't if I just heard that uh, Judas's speech out, out, out of context I would have thought that it was uh, 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 like a like a slave revolt you know. Uh, something like it sounds like Toussaint Louverture, you know that that kind of uh, that kind of language, and so it shows it, 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 that 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 spirit has kind of has has always been uh, has always been with us, and uh, and that we do have enemies, and that there is a time uh, to take a stand uh, and, and lay down your life, you know, um, for your for your freedom and the freedom to keep uh, and to celebrate the most high, you know. That's good, that's good. Anybody else? Um, this is Charmin. Um, yeah. I thought it was beautiful when, um, well, you know, it was sad that, you know, they were appalled when they, from my perspective, this is what I was feeling, you know, what touched me when they walked into the temple and they saw, you know, the overgrown um grass and you know the growth of the plants and stuff and you know they with loving care went ahead and um cleaned that out and brought in the, the new um, um what is a candle the showbread and their worship how you know as they began their hymns and their psalms and worshiping then they developed the freedom to worship it to me it's like you know you're worshiping and it's like when you're in the midst of your worship and the most high will touch you to me it's just i got a vivid picture in my mind of you know them worshiping and then the freedom to worship that the most high must have done you know i it's i don't even know the words to explain it but that was just beautiful to me the the freedom to worship and um you know that that's just what i pray the most high will pour out on us as well Man. You know, uh, real, real, real briefly, Myra pointed out, uh, Myra pointed out the traitors that were that were within this, and it seems like that that's just always a, a, a recurrent theme that uh, our enemies they need uh, they need us they need us to curse ourselves and 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 to turn on uh, on each other, um, all the way through uh, police informers through today, you know, so it's just. Again, you see the same, uh, you know, history re- repeating itself for nothing new un- under the sun, you know. Absolutely. Um, I agree. 
Can I go off of what to me? Said? Yeah, please do. So here's the thing again. Let me reiterate. Um, please jump right in. We have a number of people on the call. Don't be shy and hold back and just sit on the phone call. This is your opportunity to um, – to speak and edify the body and what you were able to pull out because there's a lot of meat in that. Um, so I just want to encourage you to um, jump right in. Don't, don't allow for 50 seconds of dead silence because I'll wait, um, but I won't wait, wait forever. But I want us to all participate and, and have an opportunity to speak. So go ahead, jump right in. Well, I kind of forgot what I was going to say, but it was like um, what he said, there's nothing new underneath the sun, you know, that our enemies, you know, we repeat things. And it's, right. if you, like, say that in today's society, I mean, everything that was going on back then, it seems like it's going on again today. So yep. when he says that, it seems like things repeat, it's repeating um, even now, just like now we're coming into our worship. Like I said with... Um, you know, how we have the. Uh oh. Say it again. We, we lost you. You might have muted yourself on accident or not, maybe the call dropped. Uh, but when you do come back on, yeah, she must, her call must have dropped. When she comes back in, she can finish. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that note, to kind of land back on that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will tell you, for me, as of right now, you know, it's it's sobering to think that in this awakening, the gathering of Israel nationwide, worldwide, you have to be prepared to understand that there's going to be your own people. Your, these are Israelites, your own mm-hmm. people, my blood that are going to side with the enemy to destroy you. That is extremely sobering to think about. Yes. Yes. Man, I Mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to beat it down, but I'm, I'm pretty uh, devastated. And I understand why, like, yo, you're a traitor, man. Like you get no mercy. You don't get no mercy. Like, right. you betrayed, like, yo, you you turned your back on your own house. Yep. You're no good. You're done. Like, there's, you literally sided with the enemy that's seeking to destroy your entire nation and put yep. you under bondage, and they're, they're you know, I, I can't. That's, and now the thing about it is to, to rec- recognize that in our current situation, we're going to have to most likely encounter that very thing. No, I'm sure. I'm sure there will be. Because there there always is. There always is that one or two or more, you know, that will side with our enemies. You know, so. Hey, caller, if you just back on, I think your call had dropped. If it's you that just added back on, you can go ahead and continue with your what you're stating because uh, you was you was going is pretty good. Oh, uh, it's okay, Dwayne. Um, it just you kind of when I came back on the call, you were pretty much saying it perfectly. You know, everything that was done in the past is seem it's being done today. And when I came back in on the call, you were talking about how our people betrayed them then and um it's gonna come back around again you know today our people are doing the same thing i mean there's just nothing new under the sun so that's basically it but i but thank you okay great um one last thing i'll say and again i'll open it back up for uh, you guys all to chime in one thing that was very hard for me to kind of get through and and when you hear the recording back i pause because i'm just like man i can't even believe this and that was that the other gentile nations came for spoil they came for the purpose of enslaving our people they brought shackles it says they brought shackles with them for the purpose of the slaves they were going to get Mm -hmm. that is wicked Mm mm-hmm very wicked. That is wicked. Yeah. That they yep. came to prey upon our people with shackles in hand, ready to go, just for you, with your name on it. Yep. Yep. But uh, go ahead. Any other statements and questions? Go ahead and jump on in. 
Um, Karen, what struck me was um, when they wanted to destroy us. Your earpiece is not working if you can hear us. Oh, okay, wait a minute. One second. Can you hear me now? Uh, you have to get right on the phone. I mean, we can hear you, but just so you know, it's it's as if your earpiece uh, is not, the mic's not working for you. Like your phone's in the other room. Okay, what about now? Can you hear me now? That's good. Go ahead. Okay. What I was saying was that what struck me was um, how they wanted to destroy us by stopping us from following the law, statutes, and commandments. You know, that's always seems to be the thing that they hate, you know, about us, that we, you know, worship Yah and that we keep the law, statutes, and commandments. And even later with, um, with Spain and Portugal, you know, and how that became such a big issue as well, that they made it against the law for the, the Israelites to worship um, and to keep the commandments, to, to keep the Shabbat and stuff like that. So that's, right. that's really interesting to me. Um, and then the, the other piece that um, I was encouraged by was even as small as they were, like the, someone was saying earlier, as small as a group um, of, of the army that they were, they were encouraged by what they had read in the past or knew in the past about how uh, Yah had kept us. And so that gave them enough courage to, to move forward and to fight and win, you know, against such, um, you know, like two, three times the size of the army that, that they had. So I thought that was, that was very interesting, too. Great you brought that out. Very, very good. Anyone else? Hmm. Yeah, I'll, this is Vicki Youngblood. Um I was I um, was listening to how you're talking about how they went to great lengths to uh, to make sure that we did not serve our Elohim, uh, and it seems like I, I think about during slavery, during um, even now, it's not just enough. For them to, um, it wasn't enough to have you in bondage. Uh, they had to also torture and um, just try to think of, for lack of a better word, creative ways. To mm. inflict pain on you, um, and I had to come to the realization that that's 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 the that's that spirit that comes up on them that just you know you know like I would think if if I wanted to do away with somebody, it would be enough for me just to pick up a gun and shoot them. But no, that's not enough. <laughs> it has to be some kind of torturous, painful way. Um, and to... Um, that's 100% true. Wow. And, and it's, still, it's still today. You know, when you see a, see a young man getting beat down in the street, it's not just enough for one, one or two policemen to just hold them down. Now, here comes five or six more, you know, and they have to, he's already down, he's already, you know, no threat, but they got to kick him, they got to bash his head, and in, in it's like it's, it's that, that's not enough. You got to inflict some kind of torture on, you know, and it's still the same today. Um uh, Sadly, sadly, it is, and it's, it's one of those things where um, as we awaken to who we are, which we are worldwide, and um, we're pulling our people out of these, these churches, and really the most High has already been driving most people out of these churches. He drove most of you out of these churches. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of those things where 
you'll see the true face of these people towards us. And there's really going to be like a, a line drawn in the sand. Like you're going to really know uh, who's who when it comes to Israel because Israel, you know, has no friends, has no allies. We just don't. And it's, it's a hard reality to stomach. Because most of us, we, we love everybody. We want to be friends with everybody and every nation and every tongue. And they don't like you. And cyclically, over time, they do the same things. You think it's like they've studied our history, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm about to go, uh, you know, Antiochus on you. You know what I mean? When you look at um, in times in this country, there's times not to be too deep, but they would literally boil us in sugar Mm -hmm. or boiling water. Mm -hmm. Like they would have huge little frying pans essentially, right? And they would literally burn you, fry you alive. And they got that. That's not something they just made up today. They have been doing that even back during this time period. Right, Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, I mean, uh, we're going to break every bone in your body. We're going to do all these crazy things because, like you said, it's not enough just to kill you. It's a supernatural hatred for our people right. because it we is. are Yah's chosen people. They hate us. Yep. They despise yep. our very existence. And this is why they've done several things to make sure that they destroy us completely, they did a Psalms 83 want to cut us off from being a nation that our name will never be in remembrance anymore. Uh, they tried doing witchcraft on us to get us to forget who we are and where we came from, that we would never yep. raise our heads again. So, I mean, that's well, that's something uh, you know that, that I think that's really interesting is that this being in in their records, right? Then uh, you know, there's always a there's always a, a fear of us uh, gather you know gathering together, and we know and we know this you know. Um, but whenever there's a, you know, uh, geez man, you know, two, three, four of us you know uh, gathered, especially as you know, there's been laws passed uh, uh, passed in, in, the, in the recent past to keep uh, uh, young people from gathering on the on the corners, you know. Um, they never, uh, what is it, uh, Hoover stated the greatest threat to the United States is Negro unity. Yeah. That's, yeah, you know, so it, what is it, you know, that was said in the 1950s, so what, what, you know, what is it about us, you know, we're only 12% of the American population. Um, we don't have a history of rebelling uh, against them and going into their towns and, and, and killing them, Right. So where does this where where does this fear of our numbers come from? You know, and I think that uh, that that this that this story or uh, this accounting that's in their record uh, bears witness to that. You know that uh, you know it, it, that when we when we finally gather and remember who we are and when we cry out in, in repentance, uh, that we have the right almost you know to to wage uh, you know in the most high. Um, gives us the green light. We can. We have a. We have a white. A right to battle our, our oppressors. You know. Uh, and as men, it's, it's almost expected of us. But we've been they so beat down that that you know we're we're just perpetually in this turn your other cheek attitude. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, of course advocating violence, but this warrior aspect is a part is a part of us. You know, and, and fighting for righteousness and dying for our nation. You know. And they fear but that, they, right? They know, but they know, they know, Ryan. They know that right. if we do come together in righteousness, right, um, right, we will be victorious. And our numbers can be small because they right. they know, right. and they're so afraid of losing their position because mm-hmm. they honestly, I think they honestly feel if we come in, and we will come into power. Um, that we will treat them like they have treated us. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's their biggest fear. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the thing about it, that's, that it's slick. And you think, okay, no, nah, I can't be true. And it's true. 
the leaders, all those in power on this earth from every nation and tongue know who we are. They know who we are. Yeah. Don't don't be fooled and don't don't be ignorant and think they don't know who we are all over this earth. Mm-hmm. They know. They literally are in league together. They know who we are. I have read documents that are in other languages that they will never translate into English. They will never translate in math published. They keep this stuff a lot. And most of the stuff, you got to pay for it, all right? And they talk about us openly about what they've done. So that period of time from the uh, 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, they know who we are. Yep. And they pass that down from generation to generation. Listen, you got to keep these Negroes in check worldwide. we got to be in league together to keep these folks on the hush-hush, keep them on lock. They cannot know who they are. They cannot. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's why I'm going to say this. It's not like a lot of our people are in different movements, Pan-Africanist movement, black national, black power type of stuff. Listen, like being black is not going to save nobody. And don't nobody, right. nobody, nobody's going to rally around being black. Right. Right. And nobody's going to rally ultimately around being African. Right. Okay? They're not. They're not. This is not a, 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 even about color. All right? This is about Israel. This is not about nothing else than Israel. Straight up. And so... Yeah. That's why when we're trying to awaken our people up and we're trying to rally and build community, it cannot be around some Pan-Africanist vision or dream. Because the reality is, is that until as Hebrews, a.k.a. black people, black African for the majority, until we come to grips with the fact that we have had our own blood, meaning of the house of Abram, okay, that have been infighting within ourselves, there will, it's not going to be no peaceful resolution between the, the house. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Be- because you, you, got, you literally have, what you have, if you're looking at what's going on in the continent of Africa right now, you literally have dictators and systems that have been put in power in place by the European colonizers, Okay where they literally have put the descendants of Esau, Edom, and Ishmael in power across the continent of Africa. Yeah. Yeah. They are the ones that are enabling the suffering, the poverty, the poor roads, and this power going out every four or five days. There's no fresh, clean running water, but they're getting all this oil and gas and natural resource money kicked back from the Europeans. Yep. So literally what you have is Esau, Edom, and Ishmael taking kickbacks from the Europeans in order to keep Israel suppressed. Right. They don't teach them their history. They don't teach them even their local regional history. Most of them folks can't go back farther after, you know, without speculating. Uh, they can't go back beyond 1600s, no different than we could. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because the government doesn't even teach them the history of what happened. You know what I'm saying? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an Igbo man, okay? Those in Nigeria don't even know. They don't, they're not even taught the Biafran Civil War. They're not even taught about the Civil War. They got to read that in a book from somebody else outside the country. They don't even know what happened 40, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and right now, for instance, right now on the continent, I brought this out in the uh, Seattle-Tacoma uh, Assembly. Um, I brought this out last Shabbat, and that was the fact that you have um, four major areas, really three, but four major uh, issues that are kind of uh, happening in, in the continent right now that are in regards to us. Okay, you got this agitation that's being stirred up in South Africa. Okay, yeah. you got that agitation going on. All right, you, that's like kind of post-apartheid, where literally you have uh, the Bowers that are still there. They just are the, in the shadows. 
okay, well, maybe we're not going to do a full-on apartheid, but it's a post-apartheid system where we have puppets or overseers in blackface, all right, that are the ones that are doing the dirty work on our behalf, and we give them kickbacks, okay? So that's really like the latest okay. post-colonial type situation in South Africa. Then you got Cameroon, okay? You got Cameroon. Most of us on this line that are Hebrew on this line, all right, you have ancestry that ties back to Cameroon. Yep. Cameroon or East Nigeria, it's all the same people, same region, Angola, Congo, that whole thing. And the reality is right now, specifically in Cameroon, you got Paul Bia. Paul Bia is old as hell, okay? He's been in power for 35 years, okay? This dude's a dictator. This dude's been in power for ancient, like ancient of days, okay, right? And he's been enabled to stay in power because he's in league with the European colonizers. We're going to turn a blind eye as long as you stay in the pocket of the European. As long as you stay in our back pocket and you do what we tell you to do, you're cool. Now, the moment you buck up and you try to do for the people like Gaddafi did, then you're going to get Gaddafi. Then you're going to have the whole European power structure come down on you. It just makes some stuff up. And so what you also have in Cameroon, there's various ethnicities of Hebrews that are in Cameroon. Majority of Cameroon are Hebrew Israelites. But those in power, those that run the government systems, guess who they are? They're the descendants of Esau. Because you have the Edomites that are descended from Esau, a strain of that lineage. There's multiple Edomites across the entire earth. Okay, this strain, they're, they're primarily still in Africa. They're throughout Africa. Forget borders, forget countries. They're throughout the entire region, and they've been in place in power. You look in Nigeria. Why is there so much drama and chaos in Nigeria right now? You literally have descendants of Esau that are in power. You got the, um, the herders. Okay, the Fulani herders, all right, descendants of Esau, killing, raping, burning villages down, doing the work like Antiochus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You got you got Ebo, you got Yoruba, you have Ejaw, you have all these other uh, you know Hebrew tribes that are all mixed up in there, but they're being ruled still by Esau. No different than when I I started this off yesterday when you talked about Matthew chapter two and you got King Herod killing all those children two years old and under and, you know, just kill everybody. All the males, kill them mm -hmm. out of fear of the Mashiach. So you got our people fighting for, to break away from Nigeria. They're fighting to break away from Nigeria and they're being ruled by the descendants of Esau that are enabled and put in power by the Europeans. When the British left Nigeria, they left the House of Fulani in power. So you're dealing with literally the descendants of Esau and ancient Assyrians. Mm. And you got the majority of where we came from. You talk about the Bantu expansion, or you could say the dispersion of the Northern Kingdom right, into Africa, the Bantu expansion, that's our people. That whole region of Biafra, Cameroon, Congo, Angola, Nigeria, Niger or Niger, that's our people. Mm -hmm. And so this, this oppression and violence, you're trying to figure out why in the world are these black folks, these quote-unquote Africans killing each other and fighting on each other, it's, be, it's literally talking about the difference between the descendants of Esau, Ishmael, and some of the other tribes that are oppressing our people. Mm -hmm. And they're enabled by the Europeans. That turn a blind eye. The UN won't do nothing. The United States won't do nothing. And so literally, Israel, we are all we got. We are all we got in America. We're all we got in Cameroon. 
We all we got in the Congo. We are all we got in Nigeria. We all we got in Ghana. We all we got in Sierra Leone. It's, it's, we, are, we are all we got. And to serve the Most High with fear and trembling, being obedient to his word. So I'm going to stop right there. I know I went off a little bit, but it, it just it gets me no, going when I, when I see uh, Very good. the state of our people and what we're going through even to this day and how this is playing out to this very day. And we have been domesticated. We have yeah, become cool. docile. Mm-hmm. And it's time for us to be bold in regards to who we are, whose we are. We got to love ourselves. All right, I'm going to stop. Anybody else got anything <laughs> want to add? <laughs> what, well, one thing I'm going to say is, and I agree 100% with you, and what we have to understand is as long as we got Yah and we are following his laws, statutes, and commandments, we are going to be victorious regardless of who doesn't like us, you know, regardless who doesn't who hates us. Yah got us, you know, and it's going to be you know what to pay. <laughs> When Yah pours out his wrath, and people are going to be like, oh, snap, you know? Amen. And, and if I could let me back on that one right there. Can you hear me? Jump on in. Yeah, jump on in. Um, and, and to let me back off of that one, there are a couple of things that we see um, that you, uh, that you, Yuda did um, that was kind of cyclical to what we did before before battle. Um, it was a hope, so I called them like the little keys to victory there. By keeping, by wanting and having the heart to seek and keep the laws and the statutes, uh, statutes of Yah, um, there was also a hope for victory in Elohim. And then they cried out and made supplication to Elohim. And then they got themselves in an agreeable position. And then something we've been learning about in restoration of our understanding of who we are and our customs they sounded the trumpets, and those were the keys, or some of the keys there, and the and that and that passage, that helped them to kind of uh, induce the presence of Yah towards their uh, victory, or towards to get to get him on their side, to operate on their side, to get the victory. Absolutely. Oh, Anybody else? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I would just like to say that uh, I can't really remember what the verse is, but there's something about um, how Yah is going to deliver us when there's no might in our hands. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe it's got to get to that point for a lot of people to really see um it hasn't gotten uh, bad enough yet. <laughs> it's bad, but it's not bad enough. And a lot of people wake up and see what's really happening. And when there's absolutely no might in our hands and all these uh, things, all these nations have come against us, uh, you know, then we, and we're, we're calling on his name together as a whole, then the Most High is going to show himself mighty. Mm-hmm. And then there's not going to be any doubt as to who we are and who we belong to. So uh, uh, I can't, I wish I could remember where that verse is, but I can't, can't remember right now. Uh, I, I know where you're coming from, and that's something where um, it's, it's very true. Um, and I just, I pray that it doesn't get, it doesn't have to get too bad before we recognize that again, we're all we got and all we have is the most high. Mm-hmm. I just, cause, cause the thing about it is that we, I, there's so much that's happening across the diaspora right now and on the continent where we're, we're being destroyed. And the reality is, I mean, look at us here in America. Like, these folks got jets, they got bombs, nuclear missiles. Uh, they, they got sonic weapons, and who knows what else they got going on. 
Um, they're mm-hmm. already killing us with the water and the air and, and the food and everything else. Mm-hmm. Like, so they're doing everything they got to do to kill us and, and put us under. You know what I mean? But it's just like, I, I do pray that it doesn't take um, mass devastation for us to recognize we have to come together and cry out to the most high Odin. I hope not either. But when you look at some of our people, you know, I think about some of our people, they're just like, um, uh, they're like a, they're like a child with no understanding. I uh, don't, don't think and look around, stop to look around. Uh, all they know is that, you know, man, I'm having a good time and living my best life and, um, you know, nothing's really happening to me, so, mm-hmm. you know, but you can't even get some of our people even discuss the things that is, that's going on to us, that's happening well, to us in this country right was, now. Mm. Some of our, some of our people can't want to mm. even discuss it. It's like they have a uh, internal um, regulator that says, you know, you know, I can't discuss that, you know. Right. So, I don't know. An inversion. No, you do know. You hit it on the head. You do know you hit it on the head, and the, and the sad thing about it is, um, you know, we have to love ourselves. We have to love each other. Period. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, those of you that know me, um, most of you should know me. Some of you might be from uh, the Facebook page or or uh, you know YouTube or something like that. Um, you know, I travel across the the country, and I see the state of our people, the poverty. I see the fact that the interaction we have within ourselves, I see how um, in some cases we don't even look each other in the eye anymore. That's true. And, and back in the day, that was never a thing. Back in the day, a, a Hebrew man, a black man, is going to acknowledge a black man. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, we're not giving no eye contact. We've been made to become afraid of our own selves. And that, that should not be the case. And we've been conditioned by our enemies because they literally, a certain group of people, we won't go there because uh, different things, a certain group of people have had the reins of our culture and have been able to twist it and turn it at their will to push the agenda they want to push for our people and that has to stop we have to take back our culture we have to take back our history we have to uh, proclaim who we are and we have to return to the law statutes and commandments of the most high Yah and apply them and no infighting because a question was posed yesterday in regards to the whole Maccabean experience the whole conflict why did this happen how did this happen what did the people do that, you know, made way for this to happen? And if you didn't pay attention, you'll go back on the lesson that we did yesterday um, in Chapter 1 of uh, Book 12, and also the very beginning of Chapter 5 breaks it down. Literally, there was strife within the house of Israel amongst the leaders. And that's what brought division and discord. The Most High already told us, Yeshua already told us, that a house divided would not stand. And because we had a divided house within Jerusalem, where literally you had a a division, a civil war between the king and the priests, that's what provoked this entire destruction upon the nation was internal infighting amongst Israel. And it's just tragic that you see that there's going to likely still be a separation between those of us that seek to return to the law, sex, and the commandments and walk it out, and those that choose to be a Gentile and a heathen and go against their own people. 
Man. Yeah. All right, we're about to go ahead and get into um, chapter three of First Maccabees. Anybody have any other statements that they want to get out real quick? I think the one thing I wanted to add to what the, the lady said before you spoke there was about um, about why we act a certain way and, and kind of coming from a different perspective. From what I've seen is that when you when you take the the when you look at it from the psychological perspective of of a of, of a victim being perpetrated or having been perpetrated um, so much hate, so much love. I mean, so much hate, so much damage, so much of this, you know, negativity. All that person has um, is to do is to to conform and to turn away from themselves. You know, um, you learn about, you know, victim impacts uh, and how, you know, in, in abusive relationships, um, women turn turn out to be a certain way based upon their victim, um, uh, based upon the aggressor. And mm-hmm. over time, people have taken this woman Israel because of her own kind of uh, thought patterns of thinking that their ways are better and have become the have be, have become subjected to their their violence and that has turned that woman of Israel a certain way and we can't understand that until that woman heals herself and like you're saying loves herself more internally and then therefore externally so that she can so that she can grow and become that woman I think you had read it before in the book of uh when we first have met, talked about Israel being a woman and having the two sisters and how Yah had raised her up from the from being a babe and cleaned her up. And then that's what he right. has to do again. He has to do that again because she has gone out there and I don't want to ramble on for too, too long, but uh, has gone out there and done these things with other uh, other nations in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. That's good stuff. All right, I'm going to jump into Chapter 3. We are now in First Maccabees Chapter 3, and I will pause briefly for that chapter, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, if we have enough time, we will also get Chapter 4 done, um, but I don't want to go longer than two hours, so here we are. Uh, verse 1. Then his son, Judas, Judah, who was called Maccabeus, took command in his place. All his brothers and all who had joined his father helped him. They gladly fought for Israel. He extended the glory of his people like a giant he put on his breastplate. He bound on his armor of war and waged battles, protecting the camp by his sword. He was like a lion in his deeds like a lion's cub roaring for prey. He searched out and pursued those who broke the law. He burned those who troubled his people. Lawbreakers shrank back for fear of him. All the evildoers were confounded and deliverance prospered by his hand. He embittered many kings, but he made Jacob glad by his deeds, and his memory is blessed forever. He went through the cities of Judah. He destroyed the ungodly out of the land. Thus, he turned away wrath from Israel. He was renowned in the ends of the earth. He gathered in those who were perishing. Apollonius now gathered together Gentiles and a large force from Samaria to fight against Israel. When Judah learned of it, he went out to meet him, and he just then killed him. Many were wounded and fell, and the rest fled. Then they seized their spoils, and Judah took the sword of Apollonius and used it in battle the rest of his life. Now when Saron, the commander of the Syrian army, heard that Judah had gathered a large company, including a body of faithful soldiers who stayed with him and went out to battle, he said, I will make a name for myself and win honor in the kingdom. I will make war on Judah and his companions who scorn the king's command. 
Once again, a strong army of godless men went up with him to help him to take vengeance on the Israelites. When he approached the ascent of Bethorn, Judah went out to meet him with a small company. But when they saw the army coming down to meet them, they said to Judah, How can we, few as we are, fight against so great and so strong a multitude? And we are faint, for we haven't eaten anything today. Judah replied, It is easy for many to be hemmed in by few. For in sight of heaven there is no difference between saving by many or by few. It is not the size of the army that victory in battle depends, but strength comes from heaven. They come against us in great insolence and lawlessness to destroy us, our wives, our children, and to despoil us. But we fight for our lives and for our law. He himself will crush them before us. As for you, do not be afraid of them. When he finished speaking, he rushed suddenly against Saron and his army, and they were crushed before him. They pursued them down the descent of Bethoron to the plain. Eight hundred of them fell. The rest fled into the land of the Philistines. Then Judah and his brothers began to be feared and terror fell on all the Gentiles around them. His fame reached the king, and the Gentiles talked of the battles of Judah. When King Antiochus heard these reports, he was greatly angered, and he sent and gathered all the forces of his kingdom, a very strong army. He opened his coffers and gave a year's pay to his forces and ordered them to be ready for any need. Then he saw that the money in the treasury was exhausted and that the revenues from that country were very small because of the dissension and disaster that he had caused in the land by abolishing the laws that had existed from the earliest days. He feared that he might not have such funds as he had before, for his expenses and for the gifts that he used to give more lavishly than preceding kings. He was greatly perplexed in mind. Then he determined to go to Persia and collect the revenues from those regions and raise a large fund. He left Lysias, a distinguished man of royal lineage, in charge of the king's affairs, from the river Euphrates to the borders of Egypt. Lysias was also to take care of his son, Antiochus, until he returned. And he turned over Lysias, half of his forces, and the elephant, and gave him orders about all that he wanted done. As for the residents of Judea and Jerusalem, Lysias was to send a force against them to wipe out and destroy the strength of Israel and the remnant of Jerusalem. He was to banish the memory of them from the place settle aliens in their territory and distribute their land by lot. Then the king took to the remaining half of his forces and left Antioch, his capital, in the 147th year. Off the Euphrates River and went through the upper provinces. Lysias chose Ptolemy, son of Dormanus, and Nicanor, and Gorgias, able men among the friends of the king and sent with them 40,000 infantry, 7,000 cavalry to go into the land of Judah and destroy it as the king had commanded. So they set out with their entire force and when they arrived, they encamped near Amias in the plain. When the traders of the region heard what was said to them, they took silver and gold in immense amounts and fetters and went to the camp to get the Israelites for slaves and forces from Syria and the land of the Philistines joined with them now Judah and his brothers saw that misfortunes had increased and that the forces were encamped in their territory they also learned that the king had commanded to do to the people to cause their final destruction 
But they said to one another, let us restore the ruins of our people and fight for our people and the sanctuary. So the congregation assembled to be ready for battle and to pray and ask for mercy and compassion. Jerusalem was uninhabited like a wilderness. Not one of her children went in or out. The sanctuary was trampled down. The aliens held the citadel. It was a lodging place for the Gentiles. Joy was taken from Jacob. The flute, the harp, ceased to play. Then they gathered together and went to Mitzpah, opposite Jerusalem, because Israel formerly had a place of prayer in Mitzpah. They fasted that day, put on sackcloth, sprinkled ashes on their heads, tore their clothes, and they opened the book of the law to inquire into those matters about which the Gentiles consulted the likeness of their gods. They also brought the vestments of the priesthood and the first fruits and the tithes, and they stirred up the Nazarites who had completed their days And they cried aloud to heaven, saying, What shall we do with these? Where shall we take them? Your sanctuary is trampled down and profaned. Your priests mourn in humiliation. Here the Gentiles are assembled against us to destroy us. You know what they plot against us. How will we be able to withstand them if you do not help us? Then they sounded the trumpets and gave a loud shout. After this, Judah appointed leaders of the people in charge of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Those who were building houses or were about to be married or were planting a vineyard or were faint-hearted, he told to go home according to the law. Then the army marched out and encamped against the south in Emmaus. Judah said, arm yourselves and be courageous. Be ready early in the morning to fight with these Gentiles who have assembled against us to destroy us and our sanctuary. It is better for us to die in battle than to see the misfortunes of our nation and of the sanctuary. But as his will in heaven may be, so shall he do. And you have now just heard First Maccabees chapter 3. Open the floor to discussion. Floor is yours. Go right ahead. What are your thoughts? Well, this is Yvonne. Um, it just seems like it's just a constant battle for religious freedom. These Edomites and um, Gentiles are relentless, just relentless against our people so that they can fall, so that they can be in power. All of this it is, it is about their being in power and control and hatred for the Most High <clears throat> and a hatred for his law, statutes, and commandments. Hey. Absolutely. It's tragic. Anybody else jump right in? This is Alex. Um, that chapter, there is a lot of similarities. If you're familiar with the writings of Yeshua, he mentioned some of the same things that were going to happen again that we see happening in the uh, third chapter of the book of Maccabees. Um, We see that um, the book of Maccabees had Gentiles that was occupying it. And the same thing Yeshua said was going to happen also, that Gentiles will occupy the Holy Land until uh, the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Um, There was another verse um, that was very similar also, 
Oh, but, you know, um, it, it, it just kind of escaped my mind. But, you know, um, it, like I said, I, I, I just want to um, chime in and just say that those two, um, uh, that chapter, if you, if you read it again in your spare time and begin to meditate on it, you'll see some of the same things happening that Yeshua told us would happen in the future again. So, so it's almost like a parallel. It's almost like um, that happened, and Yeshua is telling us to be on guard because those things will happen again, almost as if during the time of the ingathering or the regathering of Israel, these same type of Maccabean battles and struggles would, in fact, um, go on again. Very good. Great insight on that. And you absolutely see that, even down to the fact of the infighting amongst Israel, which led to them not being on point. They weren't ready. And that's what led them. I mean, the most high was out. You know? You're not going to have that discord and, and violence and um, all the evils they were doing. And the Most High just, you know, he got you. You can't do that. They turned, it's just very good insight. Anybody else, again, jump right in. Um, this is Myra. Um, one of the things that keeps popping into my head is also the birthright. I mean, you got Esau. Edom, still angry about the birthright. Mm-hmm. You got you got Ishmael, ticked off, still about the birthright. <laughs> I mean, it, and that's what I keep hearing. It's about the birthright too. And that was the thought I had. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, and what's funny, and I'll go into it in a later time. Not not right now. But in uh, West Africa, there are certain regions where um, internally, because, again, we don't really focus on our own languages, right? We, we, we want to learn Spanish and, you know, Portuguese or, you know, Russian and German and French, okay? Uh, but we don't want to learn about our own languages of our people in West Africa. Uh, in West Africa, there are actual tribes. They keep it internal, and it's in their languages. And they boast about being the chosen seed of Isaac. But they ain't talking about Israel. But they mm-hmm. sure enough brag and boast about being the chosen seed of Isaac um, while they oppress the actual chosen seed of Isaac through Israel. So um, that would be a different lesson, different topic, and different things like that. But very good point. Anybody else, please uh, chime in. That was a lot on that chapter. Yeah, I, you know, I, I see, um, uh, I see, um, uh, uh, Judas is almost like, uh, uh, like a, almost like a Luke Cage <laughs> kind, kind of a, kind of a guy, you know, because uh, you know, it, it's interesting to see him how he, he was obviously engaged in his community, and they looked up to him. And he was almost like uh, kind of kind of like uh, one of the judges of old, you know. Um, but he uh, um, uh, uh, he brought um, it, you know like a like a righteous hope, you know, am- amongst the people. And um, uh, and it was obvious that that, uh, that he loved his own, you know. Um, but it was it's it I get a really visual sense of how of how involved he was with his uh, uh, with his with his with his community at the time. Absolutely, I mean I like that kind of Luke Cage analogy. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. But yeah, <laughs> absolutely, it's it's something where, um, you know, when you look in America right now, you look at the system we're in, and you look at you know they got the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard. They got you know the State Department and. FBI and CIA, and they got all these different things going on, right? And you think about just somebody trying to rise up against all that. That's literally the equivalent of what what Yuda was doing in that time mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Having lackluster weapons, you know what I'm saying? And you're fighting against entire nations, and even to the point where the men are saying, look, we like a few, like 300 men. Basically, right? We like the original 300 right now, 
right? Mm-hmm. And look at that army. And he and the thing about him that was uh, powerful was he embodies the spirit of Judah. He embodies, so he carries the name well. He embodies the spirit of David as a warrior in battle, a fight. And he was zealous for the law. I mean, man, he loved his people to the point where he was driving out unrighteousness even amongst his mm-hmm. own. So he mm-hmm. was equal opportunity. If you're wicked, mm-hmm. you're, getting, you're getting cut. You're getting ran up out of it. Right, you. right. You know what I mean? So he's a, he's a great, um, great leader and someone in this time period we all should be looking up to, um, especially in regards to awakening our people to who they are, being obedient to what you've been called to do. I'm going to stop because I'll get going. But anybody else got something they want to add? <laughs> Jump on in. And in verse 45, this is Vicki Young Brothers. In verse 45, it says, Now Jerusalem lay void as a wilderness, and there was none of her children that went in or out. The sanctuary also was trodden down, and aliens kept a stronghold. The heathen had their habitation in their place, and joy was taken from Jacob, and the pipe and the heart ceased. Uh, what caught me there was the the heathen had their habitation in that place. And wherever the heathen is, our joy is taken away. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Wherever we are with the heathen, that's why he he said, you know, way back in... in um, at Mount Sinai, you know, not to have any dealings with the heathen because they take our joy away from us. Either, uh, you know, either they turn some of our people's heads and make them uh, turn their back on their people or they bring mm-hmm. death, destruction, and persecution, you know, something. You know, very very true, and that's very, that's very the true. condition of our people today. All of our people are living among the heathen, and we have troubles on top of troubles. You know, because of the heathen. I mean, it's very true, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, it's up to the the men and women of Israel today. To take up the mantle of Judah Maccabee and be about your people. And my charge to each and every one of you on this call, all you Israelites, is to literally, you need to be obedient to what the Most High has called you to do. Don't get distracted. Don't go to the left or to the right. Whatever the last thing the Most High told you to do, that's what you need to do and do it passionately. You prioritize your life, and you make that thing happen. Do not delay. And on top of that, it's, on, it's, it's uh, incumbent upon us to support one another, to enable each other in our walk in obedience to the Most High. And if you do see your brother or sister stumble or, or waver in their faith, encourage them like Judah Maccabee did to continue their walk in obedience. So we can get up out of here because my thing is I don't want this burden to have to pass on to my children or my grandchildren or my great grandchildren. We got to handle this business now. So anybody else in regards to chapter three? I have something else. I've, I've, I've read this before, and I've often thought I thought about it a lot. And that's uh, where mm-hmm. verse 48, where it says, And they laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen had thought to paint the likeness of their images. Mm-hmm. Don't we see that today? I mean, it's been done. Yes. We, we have what, like 
I mean, and even in just in the world, now, the music in this country was basic. The whole music industry revolves around the music that Hebrews have made. But if you notice, they have, they, they are trying to steal blues. They're trying to steal rock and roll. Well, they're, you know, so rock and roll, you know, and they call it, that, you know, they're the ones who, if you if you listen closely, they'll almost like want want you to believe that you know that they're the ones who started all this. And um, right. it's like they hate us, but they want our stuff, you know. Uh, and I've always, you know, and I think about that today. And when I was growing up all the images we saw of people in the Bible were Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Even though, like you said, like you said before, there, there are lots of people who know who we are, but still they want to put themselves in our book. But it's not, they, they can't, they can't do anything on their own except think of ways to try to destroy us. But they can't duplicate what the Most High has given us. So uh, so they have to, they, they still have to use, use us. Even the language and everything has, has come from, from, um, from our language. And right. uh, so they're actually, if they would just stop and think, they're actually nothing without us. And, um, I mean, I, that's just always been in the back of my mind, that they're always putting their images in place of our, on our stuff. They're putting their uh, stamp on our stuff all the time. I don't care what it is. Music, I think dance, they know that. You know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, music. I don't care what it is, hairstyle. You know, slang, whatever. You know, I remember a uh, long time ago. You hardly ever heard a Caucasian woman call another Caucasian woman "girl." Hey, girl. Yeah, that's all I hear. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. About you can't. You can't have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and we we barely even say that hardly anymore. But now you just get this, and it's a lot of us say it to each other. Hey, girl. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, the the, the bottom line is this. I mean, um, everybody wants to be us, but they don't want to be us. Yeah. And, they, mm -hmm. and, and they'll claim to be us until that you know something jump off, and then it's like we talked about yesterday with the Samaritans. You know what I mean? They had to break out the public record and say, hey, just so you look, look at the public record, we ain't them people. That's a lie we were stripping. You know? Um, <laughs> either way, it, yeah. I mean, I think the thing about it is they know they have to keep us subjected. They know they can't completely destroy us. But they know that if they can, if they can keep us in a pep perpetual state of destruction, they can cleave to power. Um, mm -hmm. They know what the book says, but the goal is continually to seduce Israel into sin and to provoke and to stir up in a way that keeps us out of covenant. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, and I'm jumping way ahead, but we see it even within the Hasmonean family or dynasty at the end of that dynasty, which leads into the Herodian dynasty, you have the cycle repeating itself. And for me, I have to kind of chew on that for a while because, you know, like the other brother had brought out, you know, Yeshua has spoken about it. We see the example here in Maccabees. We saw that with the, with the, the second temple being destroyed but also before even the birth of Yeshua and the rise of the 
Herodian dynasty of King Herod coming into power, appointed by certain people, right? We, we literally see that there was strife, there was division, there was infighting within the house that led to our downfall and destruction of the entire people. So, I mean, that's a cycle that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. And even for me, that I have to take that really seriously in regards to at least uh, having my mindset on how we can prevent that from being a thing. We don't got another, you know, a thousand years or something, or four hundred years or whatever. But we gotta get this thing right, and and mm-hmm. we gotta get it right. Bam. So. Anybody else? All right, I'm jumping in. I want to close out this chapter four, and then we'll wrap it up from there. All right. Now Gorgias took 5,000 infantry and 1,000 picked cavalry, and this division moved out by night to fall upon the camp of the Yahudi and attack them suddenly. Men from the citadel were his guides. Man, that's wicked. These are the same, again, and Josephus who talks about these were the, the wicked renegade Yahudi. So men from the citadel were his guides. But Judah heard of it, and his warriors moved out to attack the king's force in Emmaus, while the division was still absent from the camp. Now when Gorgias entered the camp of Judah by night, he found no one there. So he looked for them in the hills because he said, these men are running away from us. At daybreak, Judah appeared in the plain with 3,000 men, but they did not have armor and swords such as they desired. And they saw the camp of the Gentiles, strong, fortified, with cavalry all around it. And these men were trained in war. But Judah said to those who were with him, do not fear their numbers or be afraid when they charge. Remember how our ancestors were saved at the Red Sea when Pharaoh with his forces pursued them. Now, let us cry to heaven to see whether he will favor us and remember his covenant with our ancestors and crush this enemy before us today. Then all the Gentiles will know that there is one who redeems and saves Israel. When the foreigners looked up and saw them coming against them, they went out from their camp to battle. Then the men with Judah blew their trumpets and engaged in battle. The Gentiles were crushed and fled into the plain, and all those in fear fell by the sword. They pursued them in Gazara and to the plains of uh, Idumia and to Azotos and Yamnia, and 3,000 of them fell. Then Judah and his force turned back from pursuing them. And he said to the people, Do not be greedy for plunder, for there is a battle before us. Gorgias and his force are near in the hills, but stand now against our enemies and fight them. Then afterwards seize the plunder boldly. Now just as Judah was finishing this speech, a detachment appeared. Coming out of the hills, they saw that their army had been put to flight and that the Yahudim were burning the camp, for the smoke that was seen showed what had happened. When they perceived this, they were greatly frightened. And when they also saw the army of Judah drawn up in the plain for battle, they all fled into the land of the Philistines. Then Judah returned to plunder the camp, and they seized a great amount of gold, silver, and cloth dyed blue, purple, and great riches. On their return, they sang hymns and praises to heaven. For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Thus, Israel had a great deliverance that day. 
Those of the foreigners who escaped went and reported to Lysias all that had happened. When he heard it, he was perplexed, discouraged, for things had not happened to Israel as he had intended, nor had they turned out as the king had ordered. But the next year he mustered 60,000 picked infantry and 5,000 cavalry to subdue them. They came to Idumea and encamped at Bethzor. Judah met them with 10,000 men. When he saw that their army was strong, he prayed, saying, Blessed are you, O Savior of Israel, who crushed the attack of the mighty warrior by the hand of your servant David and gave the camp of the Philistines into the hands of Jonathan, son of Saul, and of the man who carried his armor. Him and this army by the hand of your people Israel, and let them be ashamed of their troops and their cavalry. Fill them with cowardice. Melt the boldness of their strength. Let them tremble in their destruction. Strike them down with the sword of those who love you. And let all who know your name praise you with hymns. Then both sides attacked, and there fell of the army of Lysias 5,000 men. They fell in action. When Lysias saw the rout of his troops and observed the boldness that inspired those of Judah and how ready they were either to live or to die nobly, he withdrew to Antioch and enlisted mercenaries in order to invade Judea again with an even larger army. Then Judah and his brothers said, See, our enemies are crushed. Let us go up to cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. So all the army assembled and went up to Mount Zion. There, they saw the sanctuary desolate, the altar profaned, the gates burned. In the courts they saw bushes sprung up as in a thicket or as one of the mountains. They saw also the chambers of the priests in ruin. They then tore their clothes and mourned with great lamentation. They sprinkled themselves with ashes and fell face down on the ground. And when the signal was given, with the trumpets they cried out to heaven. Then Judah detailed men to fight against those in the citadel until he had cleansed the sanctuary. He chose blameless priests devoted to the law, and they cleansed the sanctuary and removed the defiled stones to an unclean place. They deliberated what to do about the altar of burnt offering, which had been profaned, and they thought it best to tear it down so that it would not be a lasting shame to them that Gentiles had defiled it. So they tore down the altar and stored the stones in a convenient place on the temple, a hill until a prophet should come to tell what to do with them. Then they took unhewn stones as the law directs and built a new altar like the former one. They also rebuilt the sanctuary and the interior of the temple and consecrated the courts. They made new holy vessels and brought the lampstand, the altar of incense, the table of the show bread to the temple. Then they offered incense on the offer and lit the lamps on the lampstand. And these gave light in the temple. They placed the bread on the table and hung up the curtains. Thus, they finished all the work they had undertaken. Now, early in the morning on the 25th day of the ninth month, which is the month Kislev, in the 148th year, they rose and offered sacrifices as the law directs on the new altar of burnt offering that they had built. At the very season and on the very day that the Gentiles had profaned it, it was then dedicated with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces 
and worshiped and blessed heaven. Their mighty Elohim who had prospered them. So they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and joyfully offered burnt offerings. They offered a sacrifice of well-being and a thanksgiving offering. They decorated the front of the temple with golden crowns and small shields. They restored the gates and the chambers for the priests and fitted them with doors. There was great joy among the people and the disgrace brought by the Gentiles was removed. Then Judah and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season, the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of Kislev. At that time, they fortified Mount Zion with high walls, strong towers all around in order to keep the Gentiles from coming and trampling them down as they had done before. Judah stationed a garrison there to guard it. He also fortified Bethsur to guard it so that the people might have a stronghold that faced Idumea. And that is 1 Maccabees chapter 4. All right, go ahead and I'll open the lines up. Your comments. Don't be shy. Jump right in. Yeah, you know, once again, I, I just hear the, I just feel the, um, just the hatred of of Yah, of the Gentiles, and um, and that did kind of give me a better idea about um, the feast of of uh, lights or the the festival of lights. <clears throat> so. Um, I I I I think I get it now. I'm not sure. I, I am open to exactly what we can do because it, it well it says to it's a, it's a Thanksgiving and joyous occasion eight days. So hmm, okay. Uh, this is Alex again. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just, you had been making the comment about how, um, you know, we, we're going to have to unify. And as long as there's infighting, we won't be able to do that. And and, and just, just listening to that, um, it, it's true. Part of our, part of our unification, we're going to have to, to really, recognize internally you know it's one thing to say it on paper you know it's it's one thing to say you know we know that Edom or you know whomever is our enemy but we are really going to have to to recognize that that like everybody else on the line was talking and, and saying you know this enemy is jealous of us um you mentioned that they want to subjugate us. They don't want to kill us off completely because then they can't get any of our ideas, you know. They can't take our style anymore, our, our swag. For the money, for the $1.1 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that too. Um, you, know, um, you know, like I say, they don't want to kill us completely because, you know, they won't have any more swag to steal. But, you know, if we don't recognize that, if we don't make ourselves separated and holy, you know, which is, which is really set apart, you know, if we don't set ourselves apart and see who our enemy really is, we will never be able to truly unify and, and come together and do like the law instructs us. It, it mentioned twice in that chapter, chapter four, and once in the third chapter to do like the law instructs us. The law instructs us to be 
you know, what the King James translates as set apart. It's, well, be holy, it's, but it's set apart. Be set apart because I, the Lord, your God, am set apart. We won't separate. And until Israel learns to separate, we won't be able to unify. And so that's sort of what I'm taking out of it. I also like the very end of the chapter how after they dedicated the temple, you notice how it said they placed a garrison <laughs> there to watch Edom, you know, mm-hmm. to watch Idumia. And, 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 and we, we're falling short in that area, too. We won't keep an eye on our enemies. We, after we cleanse our temple, after we rededicate ourselves to Yeshua, after we have our own internal feast of dedication and do the cleansing like the law says, you know, do our hand washings or mikvahs or whatever we do, we need to now unify and start to keep an eye on our enemies. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, good words. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. Jump on in. I like how, uh, how Elysius uh, was, was perplexed, you know. And the Most High, he, uh, you know, it says that, uh, you know, he, he likes to uh, confound uh, his enemies, you know. And, uh, uh, and he brings uh, uh, the high low. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, he, of course, he can operate independent of us, but he allows us to, um, to participate in that, you know. So just seeing... Uh, just seeing uh, Judas and, and, and our ancestors um, in their small numbers, uh, and again, you know, uh, why, you know, why they fear us, you know. I mean, I can see that, you know, on the, on the, on the battlefield, they must have been doing some, <clears throat> some pretty janky maneuvers. <laughs> yeah. it, must been, it must have been something to behold, you know. Uh, you know, again, like you kind of look at our at our at our NFL players. You know, you put those. You know that you know the, that that spirit of Judah, like that that physique, um, under the right temperament, with the right conditions. You know, with with the spirit of the Most High. I, like I said, I'm sure you know it must have been some something to behold. And uh, and in the end, you know, it it, it perplexed uh, Lysias, You know, because his his plans for Israel didn't go quite as he had thought. <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, I'm sure that, you know, that this, that this scene has <clears throat> been etched in the memory of our, uh, of our enemies and, and how to, how to get them to prevent, you know, another Maccabean revolt among, among, among the people is, is very important to them. Absolutely. Oh, Good word. All right. Anybody else jump on in? Shalom. Um, no, this is Cyrus. I had a thought uh, while listening to Chapter 4. Um, something I've noticed, especially in Maccabees, is they bring to remembrance how the Most High has worked in our nation's uh, history. And that, that faith propels them, and they call upon it whenever they're faced with something. So that kind of spoke to me. Uh, now this story itself is something that we call to remembrance. Uh, something, you know, the Most High always works with, like you said before, small numbers. Uh, he's always worked with small numbers with Israel because ultimately our victory comes from the Most High. So as we are faced with things daily, um, whether spiritual or carnal, we have to, you know, invoke the power of the Most High and have faith in that, you know, use the example that we see here and that that's what they did. So that's all I have to say. That's good. Awesome. A lot of meeting there. Jump on in. Hmm. I, well, this is Amy, sorry. I wanted to say, I thought it was, um, you're kind of low, you got to come to the phone. Hey, Darren. Yeah, we can't Can you hear, you. hear me now? I'm, I apologize. Yeah, we can now. Go ahead. This is Damien uh, in Raleigh. I thought it was pretty profound when you spoke about taking on the mantle of, um, 
of uh, Judas Maccabees uh, because Josh was uh, just recently talking about that and uh, is you you saw how when they did stand up and take on old mantles, um, they also turned, you know, from their wicked ways and cried out to Yah. And he, he came forth with that power. So we, we have to be mindful, more to mind our own business, keep keep ourselves uh, righteous before him. So when we do have need, um, because the enemy is coming against us, we can reach out and seek him and call out and blow our shofars, and know that he'll show up. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think for me, what's what's so uh, emotional, and it, it's it's such a passionate situation. Where, in light of that, Judah Maccabee was, you know, him and his men were prepared to live or die. Yeah. They took a stand, and they were prepared to live or die. And they put their faith in the Most High Yah and were like, his will be done. And then they, you know what I'm saying? So, like, they didn't sit yeah. on their hands. They weren't just waiting and wondering what was going to happen. They literally had prayed unto the Most High Yah and said, let the chips fall where they fall. We trust in the Most High Yah. And whether he saves us or we get destroyed, his will be done. That's gangster right there. That's the right, there, right? And he's like, I'm about that life. We're going to do this thing. And the fact that he was able to really be a leader and, and rally his men to not be cowardice. And what I will say is that in the, in the face of his battle with the enemy, he proclaimed a judgment against them, and he declared what he wanted done in the battle beforehand. He spoke about how he wanted them to shrink back in cowardice, how he, he wanted them to be slaughtered by the swords of those who love the Most High Yah. He, he literally put forth a proclamation of victory and a proclamation of defeat against the Gentiles. That's profound. He didn't just go in wishing and hoping. He went in there and literally declared right before the battle what he wanted to have happen to them. Hmm. That's powerful. Hmm. For them to be confounded and confused and to shrink back in fear, to melt in, in, in the face of Israel. That's how we need to operate in every aspect of our lives. Because a lot of us walk around and operate in this life as if the Most High is not our Elohim. And we have to change that culture amongst ourselves and among, amongst our people. We obviously have to operate in wisdom. We can't operate and do things in our own flesh because we'll get into it in a couple other chapters where you get people that just kind of do their own thing and it don't end up too well for them. You know what I'm saying? So you you got to be led by the Most High and be obedient to what he's called you to do. And even when you don't know what to do, you operate by faith. You stand by faith. You know what I'm saying? You, you're you humble in, in how you operate. You know what I mean? These men were fighting for the, for the existence of Israel. They were fighting for the salvation of the nation. And that's what we have to understand when we look at the situation. They were fighting as desperate men for their own literal salvation and for the restoration of the temple. But anybody else? Because that was the last. That's the last scripture we're done. It's we're, we're going to close out in prayer. But I want those to have a, you know on the call to have an opportunity to say something. And again, this will be recorded. This is recorded. It'll be shared. So if you have something you want to push out that can edify others that will come across this lesson, now's the time to do it. <laughs> um, um, I was just like, go ahead. Go ahead, sis. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> jump right in. Was, uh, okay, I'll go. <laughs> uh, Judas uh, reminds me to of, of that we... And 
he was just like that we he loved the most high. He loved the most high law and he loved the most high people. He loved his people. <laughs> and on top of that that we had trusted and had faith in the power of the most high. So like that we Judas knew how to call down the powers of Shalom against the enemies of the Most High. And he knew how to get the Most High to stand up, <laughs> you know, for for Israel. And um, I can I can't imagine somebody not being <laughs> You know, not being um, ready to fight behind Judas because of his faith and because of his uh, his belief in the power of the Most High. You know, and not only did he believe, you know, in the power of the Most High, uh, he put he put he put everything he had on. It. You know, he didn't have no 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 backup plan. Uh, he didn't have a, you know, like an ace in the hole because the most high was his ace in the hole. So he, he put everything on the most high. And we can't do anything like, like, uh, Dwayne said, we can't do anything until we first start loving each other and being ready to, uh, Defend not only our people, but to defend the Most High's uh, law. Not that the Most High need defending, but the Most High see that we love Him, we love His laws, we love His people, and we're ready to lay everything out for them. Because He's not going to let His people be destroyed until He sees how much they are willing to fight for what He has given them. So, uh, 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 I just, you know, I, I like these stories. Even when I was a little girl, I always liked to read the stories of the swords and the smiting and all that because it gave me a lot of strength. And this gives us strength because to fight those spiritual battles, this was a, uh, actual battle, but you know, this is, this is also, the mirror image of our spiritual battles that we fight. You gotta be able to lay it all out there and put it all on the most high and come what come what may that his will be done. And we all must do it in love. In love for uh for our people and for the most high and what he has given us, what he's given us the truth. So uh yeah, I like this story. I love the story about Judas. Judas Maccabee. Amen. What I was gonna say is uh this is Lisa by the way. Um it's crazy how this uh it's crazy how this um, this time of that they're talking about Hanukkah, right? That's uh, it's crazy how how hijacked it got by Ashkenazis and Khazars. And I remember when I first um, first even heard about Hanukkah, it was from a very like Jewish standpoint, and they're like, we need a nine branch candelabra we need they didn't have any um the way that they explained it was that they didn't have enough oil they had enough oil to last them for one day but y'all made it last eight days and so that's why they do the whole one candle a night thing and all these gifts but that's so whack <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I never, like, I didn't, I didn't know the real, <laughs> I didn't know what the real was, like, and, and I knew something was wrong with it. So as I was doing research and learning with, and, and then I never read the Maccabees, never even heard of, of the Maccabees uh, before. So as the years went by and I got deeper into research, um, I just was like, wait a minute, you know, and everything you guys have been pulling out from what we just read is very profound, very edifying. It, it, it soaks deep in the heart and it strengthens. And I, like, I think of, um, just ha- you know, having a family one day or even talking to my sister and her children and reading this to them instead of some whack story about not having a, enough oil and Abba makes it last for eight days. Like, this is way more edifying and way more uh, connecting, and you know, and it's the truth. So I just, I just, um, that was something that stood out to me as well. That um, of how hijacked, how, how much they hijacked this thing and turned it into something completely superficial and just on the surface. And uh, if I would have grow, grew up with stories like this. Wow. Hey Amen. Absolutely. Um, and it's, 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 it's sad how hijacked and distorted our history has been. I mean, literally, they, they fell upon our culture via Edomite Jews, okay, that, that literally intermarried with them and converted them to, to the to the culture. Um, and then this is a lot of other stuff that went went, went down. Um, but mm-hmm. basically, as we were scattered and oppressed, um, there's some oppression that took place by these people as they uh, perpetuated the myth that they were us. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's crazy they really don't know what they're talking about, and it shows when you actually dig into the history for yourself, you read the scriptures for yourself. You know, I've read the Jerusalem Talmud. I've read some of the Babylonian Talmud and different things like that, which is a larger work, of, you know, body of work than people think. Um, I see where they've inserted themselves. I see where they, you know, if I, you know, bluff, this, bluff it out, people will believe me. You know what I mean? And I could pull some of these stories and make it up as I go and make it sound kind of believable. Maybe hopefully nobody will look deeper than the surface. Um, Mm -hmm. They don't know what to talk. They're making stuff up. Um, And they've added their own twists and Gentile traditions to it. It's not authentic. Um, You know, as simple as that. I mean, um, anyway, we we can jump into that. That's a different conversation. I can go hard to pound that. I don't want to get started, but right. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. Mm-hmm. But uh, any other comments you know, I want to make before I close out in prayer? I know we're we're getting a little bit long. Folks got to go to work tomorrow, so I want to afford the opportunity. Anybody else have anything else they want to say before I close out? Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yes. Um, I do hope this has been edifying to you all and that you, you know, enjoy these. Um, I really want to show, you know, this history because when you, when you dig deep um, like this, and this is, this is our history, this is not some fantastical make-believe story. These are our, our stories, and we need to learn about our history and our forefathers and foremothers and the great things they did um, it's my desire to bring these things out. So um, I'm close out in prayer. Abaya, I thank you for each and every person that's on this call and those that will hear this message in the future. Bless them and their households and all of their stewards over. This night, may they get restful sleep and awake them in the proper time in the morning, uh, rested and full of uh, vibrance and vitality to go and face the rest of this week. I pray that you uh, speak to them and bring clarity to the vision that you've given them for their life. And I pray that you strengthen them to be obedient to the call that you have for them each and every day. 
uh, watch over their household, watch over their children and their families, and uh, we seek your will. We seek your way in and through our lives. Strengthen us as you strengthen you to Maccabee and his mighty men of valor, to call on you in times like these, to humble ourselves with sackcloth and ashes, knowing that our strength comes only from you. Yeshua HaMashiach, you are our redeemer, our salvation. We cry out to you. You are our mighty battle axe to take the war effort against the enemy to reclaim the heritage of Israel. Strengthen us, guide us, empower us, direct us as to what we should do, when we should do it, and how we should do it. Bring us the victory in your name. Yes. That your name be glorified and magnified through us, your Amen. children. Yes. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You know all things, all things that are in place in your hands. And we call on you to guide us through these treacherous times. Allow us to have the revelation the revelation, knowledge, and wisdom that comes only from you. Gather us to yourself that the second exodus will kick off soon, that we can take this fight to our enemies, that we can truly be redeemed in your name. Mm-hmm. I pray this in the name, above every name, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> You guys have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Um, the root issue for that hatred towards our black brothers and sisters. The Lord woke me up kind of in the middle of the night and he answered that question and and the answer was because they're my chosen people. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to Jerusalem with great slaughter. Many outrages and atrocities were committed against the remainder of the people. It has been estimated that over one million Hebrews fled into the interiors of Africa from Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Hebrew slaves. To reconnect to your history, you need to do three things. One, you need to redefine who the children of Judah are according to the old references. Not from the 1900s to newer, because those books tend to have a totally, completely different history in those books. So you have to ask yourself, how did we lose this in history? How did you lose 400,000 people in history? And the reason why I say how did you lose 400,000 people in history is not in the books. Many people in today's time, many Israelites who don't know their heritage or who they are, are looking back. Now it is up to us to have eyes to see and ears to hear.